Hello, hello. Today we're going to be again talking about the anatomy and physiology of the prokaryotic cells. This is part two. Today we're going to be talking about the external structures such as the glycocalyx, the flagella, the axial filaments, and the fimbrae and pili. The glycocalyx is a gel-like structure around the outside of the cell. It functions in protection and attachment. There are two types. We have the capsule and the slime layer. It is involved in attachment and in enabling the bacteria to stick to teeth, rocks, and many other surfaces. The glycocalyx also allows the bacteria to grow as a biofilm. In this picture, we see many strands of bacteria surrounded by their capsule. So the capsule is in the Asiniobacter species by the gram-negative staining. Filamentous protein appendages. So, what do they do? They, they are anchored in the membrane and protrude from the surface. A flagella is a long structure responsible for motility, and it looks like a tail. So remember that the flagella is the long tail. Now the fimbrae and the pili are much shorter, resembling hair, and they are responsible for attachment. There are four types of bacteria flagella. We have the monotrichus, which is one flagella. You can remember that because mono means one. We have the amphitrichus flagella, which means flagella at both ends. We have the lophotrichus flagella, which means it has many flagella at one end of the cell, and the peritrichus flagella, which means flagella is all over the entire cell. Now you might want to remember these because this would make a good matching for a quiz or a good question on your test. Now here are some example pictures. You can put down your pens as I'm going through these. Again in the upper left we have the monotrichus, which means one flagella. In the upper right we have the amphitrichus, which means flagella at both ends. We have the bottom left is the lophotrichus, which means it has multiples at both ends. And we have the peritrichus, which is just has them all over the entire cell. Movement. Again, we said flagella help in movement, and they can do two types of movement. They can either tumble, which is a random pattern, or they can run, which is a straight and then turn and go straight again. Again in this second picture we see a run, then we see a small tumble and a run, and another small tumble and a run, and it is leading towards an attractant. So it is trying to go in one particular direction, but it must use these two types of movement to get there. Now an axial filament is presented in the spirochetes. Remember the spirochetes look like spirals. The attachment of the filament is attached at one end of the cell and spirals around and underneath the outer sheath. So it spirals around the cell like a corkscrew. And that's how it, ha how it actually moves. It moves like a corkscrew. and we are having technical malfunction. There we go. So, again on this spirochete, we see the axial filaments spiraling around the outside of the cell. Again, this allows a spiral movement, like a corkscrew. Now the fimbrae and pili. They are shorter than the flagella, and they surround the cell. They are similar structural theme to the filaments of the flagella, 
but again they are shorter and they have a different purpose. The fembre enables the cell to adhere to surfaces such as other cells, other parts of a body, and it may adhere to other surfaces even outside of a body. Now the pili join bacterial cells together in preparation for the transfer of DNA from one cell to another. That is known as conjugation, so bacterial conjugation. Well, we know it as bacterial sex. Again, the pili touch one another and the DNA flows from one bacteria into the other. An example here is we have our bacteria with our pili. Again, they are short appendages, and remember the pili is for the transfer of DNA from one bacteria to another. In this image, we see both a flagella, which is very, very long. We have the pilus, which helps in attachment and transfer. And we also have the shorter pili, which are surrounding the cell that attach to another cell and transfer DNA. Next, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to talk about the internal structures of the prokaryotic cell, such as the cytoplasm, the chromosomes, the plasmids, the ribosome, the inclusions, and the endospores. So the cytoplasm is everybody has a cytoplasm. Doesn't matter if it's you, me, plants, animals, cells, prokaryotic cells. It is the substance of this inside of the cell, inside of the cytoplasmic membrane. It is about 80% water. It is thick, aqueous, semi-transparent, elastic, gooey, gel-like substance that holds everything in place where it's supposed to be. Again, everybody has cytoplasm. The chromosomes, or as y'all know, the DNA. Now the DNA inside of a prokaryotic cell is found in a central location known as the nucleoid or the nucleoid region. Remember, there is no nucleus in the prokaryotic cells, but it is a nucleoid region where it sort of gathers. It is a single, circular, double-stranded loop. So again, only one loop of DNA for the entire bacteria but it holds all of the, the DNA required by the cell. Again, one single loop. We see the DNA up top in red. Again, it is not in a nucleus, but is kind of spread out in a nucleoid region or a specific area. At the bottom, we see a ruptured cell and the DNA is yellow. Again, that is one single loop, ladies and gentlemen. It may look like many, but it is one single loop that contains all the DNA for that prokaryotic cell. Now plasmids. Plasmids are a little bit funny. Some bacteria contain them, some don't. They are a small circle of double-stranded DNA. Now cells do not typically require these plasmids for their genetic information, but they may be advantageous, such as a plasmid may allow a bacteria to become antibiotic resistant. That's actually what has happened with MRSA or Staph. Staph has become methylene resistant Staph aureus by picking up a plasmid or a little bit of DNA that allows it to combat our antibiotic. Ribosomes. Everybody has ribosomes. But we as eukaryotes have a little bit of a different size ribosomes than the prokaryotic cells do. Again, ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis. It's where proteins are made. And it consists of two subunits. We have a 50S subunit, subunit and a 30S subunit. Now in the prokaryotic ribosomes, 50 plus 30 equals 70. Again, they're smaller and they're a little bit different configuration than our ATS ribosomes in the eukaryotes, but they still perform the same function. So remember, in prokaryotes, 50S plus 30S equals the 70S ribosomes. Again, I show you a picture of the 30S 
subunit, which is the smaller one, and the larger 50S subunit coming together to form the complete 70S ribosome. Inclusions. Inclusions are basically storage for the prokaryotic cells. It stores excess nutrients, such as an example as a polysaccharide granule that stores sugars such as glycogen and starch, or a lipid inclusion that stores oils and fats, or a metachromatin granule that actually holds inorganic phosphates that can be used to synthesize or make ATP. Remember, ATP is energy, so you might want to put energy out beside ATP. And ignore what's going on over here. So, we do have our storage granules in this particular bacteria. Endospores. Endospores are really cool, and they occur in the genre of Bacillus and Clostridium. Dormant, so an endospore is a dormant cell. It is sleeping. Not much metabolism is going on. And it is produced by the process of sporulation. Now, once it is an endospore, it can undergo germination. Germination is when the, it exits the dormant stage and becomes a vegetative cell. So a vegetative cell is an actual acting and forming and normal functioning cell. Several species of endospore formers can cause disease, such as botulism from bacillus. So here we have how we actually make an endospore. If you look up at starting point one, we have a cell that has gotten the message to create an endospore. So it starts by copying its DNA. One copy of the DNA will start having a spore septum form around it. In the second picture, we see that the plasma membrane starts surrounding the DNA and creating a, have a cytoplasm, and it isolates the DNA. In the third step, it surrounds and it forms a double membrane. In step four, the peptidoglycan, or the strong stuff, actually forms between the membranes. Fifth step is that a spore coat forms, which gives it even more strength and that it is freed from the cell. What's really cool about endospores is that they can survive extreme conditions. It can survive temperature, it can survive acid, it can survive cold, it can survive no food. So in this dormant state, it can survive. And then when conditions get better, it can actually come back. This is an example of a cell creating an endospore.